Before I read three or five, I'll just read three or four. And uh, put a marker in here. So verse I may refer to. And uh, Hare Krishna, nice to be back at Bhaktivedanta Manor. Of course, I've been around for the last couple of weeks, but uh, doing doing different things. So my apologies for not uh, coming earlier to <coughs> give class or visit class. Um, but we're uh, sort of concluding uh, Chaitanya uh, Charitamrita's Adi Leela and uh, the uh, significant or uh, important context uh, here is, and I just had a few minutes this morning to look at these verses, and considering the subject matter, so if you're prone to fall asleep, you may as well just go upstairs now and lay down, because this is not going to be anything uh, uh, exciting and full of Christmas pastimes, but uh, uh, we're, this is all about philosophy which is a, a useful thing if you want to get Krishna conscious uh, so that we actually uh, understand Krishna Tattva. Uh, Krishna Bhakti, Krishna Tattva, Krishna Prema are. Ah, there are so many features, as Krishna says, Maam Veti Tattva Taha, know me in truth. And uh, this understanding, understanding of Krishna and the things related to Krishna, is, this is one feature of Krishna that we're going to read about, this achintya, uh, achintya kalu, Krishna's uh, inconceivable nature, potencies, and so on, uh, are, uh, are very important to understand. Uh, without really understanding uh, these things, it's questionable whether one can uh, chant Hare Krishna properly and uh, free of offense. So the context was the earlier statement of uh, Kaviraj Goswami, where, which you must have read last week, where he says, he is Krishna, yet he has accepted the mood of the gopis. How is it so? It is the inconceivable character of the Lord which is very difficult to understand. Achintya charita. Uh, inconceivable. Achintya means uh, inconceivable. Achintya means conceive. And achintya means the opposite. Achintya charita. Uh, charita means character or activities. Uh, and what we're going to read uh, continues on from this concept. Why is, uh, why is it inconceivable? that he's Krishna, and yet he has the mood of the gopis, specifically he has the mood of Srimati Radharani, because usually one's mood, character, psychology is commensurate with who he is or who she is. And when it's not, that's called being schizophrenic. In other words, that you're one person, but you think that you're somebody else. So literally, this is what's actually happening. Here, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is one person, but he thinks that his mood means that's who you identify with. So let you uh, say Krishna, say Gopi, Parama Virodha, Achintya Charita Prabhura, Ati Sudur Bodha. Very difficult, Bodha, Bhuti, intelligence. Uh, and uh, Sudur Bodha, very difficult to uh, understand. So difficult to understand, how is it possible? All right, now, especially increasingly nowadays, there's more and more schizophrenic people around, but uh, you can't put that label on God. And so, of course, we don't, uh, but rather we're trying to understand this inconceivable character that he's one person, but he thinks that he's another. How is that possible? That is achintya. Okay, that's a word, and it means inconceivable. What does it actually mean? 
And uh, is it just a, you know, brush over that we're, you know, <coughs> brushing over this thing that doesn't really make sense to us, uh, and, uh, and then we just uh, go on, and uh, intelligent people will say, well, hang on a minute. This word, this uh, in chintya, this concept of being a chintya, this is like a whitewash. You can use this for anything. You know, how is it that I'm tall and short at the same time? Well, it's inconceivable. But uh, that, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't work uh, because you're not tall and short, you're just tall. And uh, we can use this as an excuse for so many things that something, well, something's inconceivable. You can't understand it. It's not an explanation. Or generally, for people with limited intelligence, it's not a very good explanation because explanation means you explain things in the way that people understand it, that it's conceivable. And to just say it's inconceivable, you may just say, well, there's no answer. So it's a, it's a very important uh, principle uh, to understand. And Kaviraj Goswami seem, uh, thinks, not seems to think, but uh, considers that this is a very important point to make before we depart from the Adi Lila and start getting into Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. Where increasingly in Madhya Lila, somewhat, but in Antya Lila, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's madness and his mood of uh, adopting the mood of the gopis and specifically adopting the mood of Srimati Radharani uh, becomes very, very pronounced. Somewhat visible during the day when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, sort of loses control over uh, his uh, ecstatic emotions, but always, every night, in the Gambira. Who's been to the Gambira? Hare Krishna, okay, some of you. Uh, if you went to the Gambira 40 years ago, th and then you really saw the Gambira. Now it's sort of, there's a lot of other things going around, but the, then you really saw what the house of Kashimisha actually looked like, because there was nothing else. I just sort of assumed that that's the way it looked like uh, 500 years ago. And there, with Swarup Damodar Goswami and Ramananda Roy, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, really, really entered these moods. And because one of them is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who's in the mood of Srimati Vadarani, the other one is in the mood of Lalita Devi, and the other one is in the mood of Vishaka. Although they're looking at each other and they're seeing men. How do you think that you're a woman when you're looking at men? And for this reason, and I won't get into that, certain so-called academics uh, question the uh, gender orientation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates. Okay, enough of that. It was good the curtains were closed. But uh, it comes up. And uh, if you tell that to a sort of open-minded person nowadays, or, then they'll come, well, how's that possible? You, you think, you know, inside you're behaving as a female, and externally you're a male. There's got to be some material explanation for this. Well, here, this is the whole idea, is that it's, it's actually inconceivable. And don't even go there for, we'll point out two reasons. So, he's Krishna, yet he's accepted the mood of the gopis. How is it so? It's the inconceivable character of the Lord, which is very difficult to understand. Sudur both. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's difficult, which means that it's not for ordinary people. One actually has to have certain quali uh, qualification in order to enter into this realm. One is you really have to be Krishna conscious. And to be really Krishna conscious, you have to have a real superlative quality of faith. Uh, and, and also you need to be learned, but over and above that, you really need to have transcendental empowerment. Okay. Now, we're continuing. One cannot understand the contradictions in Lord Chaitanya's character by putting forward mundane logic and argument. 
Consequently, one should not maintain doubts in this connection. One should simply try to understand the inconceivable energy of Krishna. Otherwise, one cannot understand how such contradictions are possible. It's just, you know, uh, you can, nowadays, all right, people try to resolve this thing. How is it that someone thinks that he's female and actually has got the body of a male? Uh, but uh, God, uh, he's got no karma. We can explain it by saying there's certain karmic uh, complications uh, that bring about such a thing. We have a karmic complication uh, that convinces us that we're this body. So it's really a detail whether you think that this body should be male or female. Uh, the fact is that that's, that's the horrible situation that we're in, identifying with this body. Uh, the gender of that body ultimately becomes a detail. But God has no karma. So then how, how, how do you explain it? And there's no other external forces that act on him. He's the source of everything. The pastimes of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are inconceivable and wonderful. Adbhuta, achintya, adbhuta. And part of this inconceivability, well, or one of, no, it's not, sorry, it's there, it is there, but inconceivability uh, awakens certain things in devotees, faithful devotees. Uh, and it, it awakens wonder. And wonder is very important because wonder is one of the things that uh, complements uh, and awakens love. So when someone's wonderful, then the tendency is there that you want to love them more. So, and of course, when something's inconceivable, then, then and you just accept that and say, how wonderful. And something, how somebody's very wonderful, uh, then that increases our attraction. So that's why this is there. Achintya, Adbudha, Krishna, Chaitanya, Vihar. The pastimes of Krishna, uh, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Mahaprabhu are inconceivable and wonderful. His ecstasy is wonderful. His qualities are wonderful. And his behavior is wonderful. If one simply adheres to mundane arguments, this is the verse preceding this one, and therefore does not accept this, he will boil in the hell of Kumbhipaka. For him, there is no deliverance. It must be a crowded place, Kumbhipaka. <laughs> and uh, so here's for the faithful, and then, all right, and here's for the unfaithful, then he will boil in the hell. For him, there is no de deliverance, purport. Prabhupada writes, Kumbhipaka, a type of hellish condition, is described in Srimad Bhagavatam, fifth canto, wherein it is said that a person who cooks living birds and beasts to satisfy his tongue is brought before Yamaraj after death and punished in the Kumbhipaka hell. There he is put into boiling oil called Kumbhipaka, from which there is no deliverance. Kumbhipaka is meant for persons who are unnecessarily envious. Those who are envious of the activities of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are punished in that hellish condition. Okay, well, that's not a place we want to go to. Now, let's chant the verse. Achintya kalu je bhava Natam starke na yojayet Prakritabhya param yatcha Tad achintya shalakshanam Okay, anyone else want to chant, go ahead. This is Sanskrit, by the way, it's not Bengali. Hare Krishna. Okay, let's do the word for word. Achintya, inconceivable. Kalu, certainly. J, those. Bhava, subject matters. Na, not. Tan, them. Tarkena, by argument. Yo jayet, one may understand. Prakritabhya, to material nature. 
Param transcendental. Yat that. Excuse me, that which. Cha and. Tat that. Achintasya of the inconceivable. Lakshanam a symptom. Translation. Anything transcendental to material nature is called inconceivable, whereas arguments are all mundane. Since mundane arguments cannot touch transcendental subject matters, one should not try to understand transcendental subject matters through mundane arguments. Okay, let's repeat. Anything transcendental to material nature is called inconceivable. Whereas arguments are all mundane, period. Since mundane arguments cannot touch transcendental subject matters, one should not try to understand transcendental matters through mundane arguments. And the purport is, this is a quote from Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami. Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Shari Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Well this starts off anything transcendental to material nature is called inconceivable which also means that anything that's transcendental material nature is inconceivable it's not just by calling it inconceivable, I mean, it is. Uh, it, it is tre- uh, inconceivable. So there is material things, and then those things which are transcendental to material things, in other words, the spiritual uh, substance, uh, and the origin of, of all spiritual potencies, uh, namely the Supreme Personality of God, that, that is all inconceivable. Uh, they are all inconceivable. Uh, and it's not just transcendental things that are inconceivable. Actually, mundane things are quite inconceivable. For instance, uh, and uh, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, yes, this material nature is endlessly mutable. Uh, what's an atom? No one knows. It's inconceivable. Uh, people don't really understand even matter and that's the whole all the branches of science just keep fur- going further and further and, and deeper and deeper in trying to understand things and there's that very nice and honest very rare that scientists say something honest but very honest statement that uh, yeah the more the more we study the more we come to realize that there's more and more that we don't know. In other words, the more that they do know opens up so many other things of more that they don't know. So it's a very similar situation because ultimately the material energy is mamamaya duratjaya. It's also very difficult to understand. Um, but in terms of understanding transcendence and transcendental subject matter, Mundane arguments don't work. That doesn't mean that there's no point in any kind of discussion. It just means that there has to, there's transcendental arguments or arguments that go along the line of Shastra, such as this class. Otherwise, we're wasting our time here. What do we have Bhagavatam class for uh, if there's no point in uh, discussing transcendental subject matter? So if we, Shastra Joni Bhat, Vedanta Sutra says, yes, you can understand, but you have to understand through Shastra. And this is one of the most important, one of the main reasons why Srila Prabhupada would always quote Shastra. So whatever he said, he would back it up 
because Prabhupada would insist, I'm not giving my opinion. I'm just saying what Krishna said, what Shastra said, what Vyasadeva said, what Shukadeva Goswami said. That's, that's what uh, that type of argument and that type of discussion uh, is acceptable. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, Prabhupada is referring uh, this verse to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, where I think uh, this, is, uh, this is already the second part, uh, which means that it's talking about Prema Bhakti. Uh, it's a well-known verse. Uh, it's uh, found, uh, found in many places, quoted by many Acharyas, uh, to establish this very same thing. So that that ultimately to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, knowledge is descending, avarohapanta, it descends. So there's these two processes, there's arohapanta and there's avarohapanta. So our whole principle, the whole principle of Shastra is that knowledge descends uh, from a perfect transcendental source. And for us, the perfect transcendental source is Shastra, uh, which we accept as Shruti Smriti, and Puranas, and then the <coughs> transcendental literature, uh, which are in pursuance of them by liberated souls, such as uh, Kaviraj Goswami, that is also Shastra. Because ultimately, what, is, what, are, what are Vedas? Vedas is what Srila Vyasadeva wrote down, and what did he write down? Uh, the Vedic literature are the truths that come from the, <coughs> emanate from the breathing of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And they are eternal truths. Uh, and if I forgot what the line of, <coughs> thinking uh, I was going in. So, uh, oh yes. And last night I was doing a program and one of the persons asked this question, well, what about this idea that Shastra is a uh, Purusheya, that it has no human origin, that it has no other authority other than itself, and it's not it's not meant to be checked by others. And this is a important point. Jiva Goswami goes into this in detail. Uh, is that yes, uh, Shastra doesn't need to refer to anything. Uh, if it had any other uh, authority to back it up other than itself, then it wouldn't be self-evident. Uh, then it wouldn't be the ultimate truth, then something else would be truth, uh, which is supporting what Shastra says. So even in the Gita, uh, Krishna says, Brahma Sutra Padeshcharva He Tu Bhanti. So even he's referring to Brahma Sutra. So Shastra is the truth, and sometimes people may say, well, that's, I can say that about anything. Well, you can, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it is. But that is actually a very logical uh, argument that some particular authority, maybe authority because it's been established by something else, because it refers to something else. And the other thing is, is that it's its own authority. And why not? And ultimately, for something to be the absolute truth, it has to be its own authority. It can't be dependent on anything else. Uh, and, and then that requires faith. That's where you stop. You can't argue beyond that. So either you accept it or you don't accept it, and then you see the particular result. So, achintya kalujhi bhava, achintya, Usually, we have one approach to inconceiv uh, something that's inconceivable, and that is that we accept the fact that we have pea brains, and uh, therefore, uh, it's not possible for us to accept things that are like unlimited. And 
even if we have spiritually empowered brains, uh, which happens uh, when one actually enters into the realm of transcendence, we still remain uh, very tiny. Uh, and we still remain just a part of the Supreme Lord. So our ability to fully understand everything, it also remains limited. If Krishna wants to reveal something, he may by empowering a devotee, uh, but otherwise not. You should turn just a little this way because you got your back to the deities, either one way or the other. Yeah. Um, but the other, so there's one. One is is that it's inconceivable to those who are very limited. Uh, our, our comprehension goes this far, and this is about things that go beyond it. So. That means you can, uh, can't really understand it. And the other uh, aspect of inconceivability uh, is contradictory. And this is what's here. This is, you know, putting, putting this gender issue aside. But these are contradictory characteristics. Someone is this and he thinks he's that. Can that be? Well, yes, it can be. So, Achintya, how is that? Well, it's inconceivable how that is, but it, it can be. So, parasya shaktir vividhaya shriyati sabhava ki jnana kriyascha. We often refer to, Prabhupada often refers to one, Krishna's potency is being inconceivable. So, as we talked about even uh, his external potency, the material energy, even that's also inconceivable. What to speak of the spiritual potency, which in certain ways becomes inconceivable to himself. So when Krishna saw Agasura, and Agasura is a manifestation of his external potency, Krishna was, Krishna for a minute, he, he just sort of was enchanted. He said, wow, that's really, that's extraordinary. Here's this eight mile long snake and uh, all the different wonderful things that my external potency can uh, can create and bring about. And there are uh, other times where Krishna even became enamored, or not enamored, but just uh, uh, was uh, meditating and wondering about, wow, how extraordinary uh, this uh, material nature is. Of course, it's not material. I'm just thinking there's one particular place in Brindavan, just on the uh, one of the sides of Govardhan Hill, where Krishna likes to just, uh, not Govardhan Hill, an underground, where Krishna likes to just look out over Brindavan and uh, enjoy the beauty of Brindavan. Uh, there's the chapter uh, about the beauty of autumn. Krishna is uh, enchanted by the uh, autumn season. And of course, in Brindavan, uh, nothing is uh, really material. Uh, but still, in terms of uh, where it's taking place, uh, it's uh, here in the material world. So even uh, even the material potency is inconceivable. Uh, what to speak of then Krishna's spiritual potencies, uh, which do very, very extraordinary things uh, and are beyond the realm it requires, as I mentioned. Uh, our, our minds and our intelligence is controlled because we're under the influence of the modes of material nature. That means we can only think materially. So these uh, tarka, this type of material argument, uh, and therefore we, our thinking is very limited. That thinking can change for us ordinary people uh, when one becomes actually empowered by Krishna's Vishuddha Sattva potency or his internal potency. And that actually takes place when devotees come from the realm of sadhana into the realm of transcendence. So, Shuddha Sattva Visheshatma, when one becomes uh, empowered or enlightened by a ray of this transcendental potency, then uh, devotees become spiritually empowered, and particularly when they become empowered by prema. 
So when their entrance into transcendence uh, develops uh, and their intelligence and their mind becomes empowered by prema, then they can actually understand things that otherwise become so for instance Gop Kumar he came down and he saw this Srimati Radharani sent him to deliver uh, this uh, Mathura Brahmana and he knew everything about it this is one characteristic of someone who is spiritually enlightened is that they are cognizant and they they are uh, avigya, they uh, know everything. What is that, avigya in English? They're uh, uh, all-knowing, someone who's all-knowing. There's a word for that. Omniscient. 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 So they're omniscient. Not omniscient like Krishna, but they're omniscient. Materially, Brahma is also omniscient, but only as far as this universe is concerned. Uh, Krishna's associates, uh, certain associates, I, I say certain associates because, for instance, some of his associates are too much absorbed in Krishna uh, to uh, pay attention to their omniscience, although they have that omniscience dormant. But others, like Vaikuntha Dutas and so on, uh, they, they know everything that's going on everywhere, and that's a lot. Not just in this universe, but any universe in the spirit. So they're, they're, they're omniscient. And how is it? Uh, because they're empowered by uh, Krishna's potency. And of course, that's also a chintya. That's also uh, inconceivable. But Krishna also has an achintya shakti, a potency of inconceivability. And that potency of inconceivability uh, is in, in itself something which helps resolve contradictory characteristics. It makes contradictory characteristics possible. At least that's one of the things uh, that it does. So, you know, it's like two cars. One car is going this way, the other one car is going this way. In the material world, they crash. If they're empowered by the Achintya Shakti, they don't crash. Or they cannot crash. They can go into each other and come across the other side, but they don't crash. So how is it possible? How is it possible for opposing things? It's possible. Similarly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, maybe Krishna, he's not maybe Krishna, he is Krishna, and he thinks that he's a gopi, but the two things are not conflicting. They coexist. You can be both, male and female simultaneously. How is it possible? It's possible by the arrangement of Krishna's inconceivable potency, his potency of inconceivability. So we have as our philosophical foundation, achinta beda beda tattva, that things are one and they're different at the same time. So that's also inconceivable. We have experience of things that are the same and we have experience of things that are different but we don't have experience of things that are the same and the different at the same time. But that is actually uh, possible, and it's possible by this inconceivable potency, which Srila Prabhupada would very often repeat uh, Jiva Goswami's statement that unless you accept this, you, you can't, you're not going to be able to accept that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, because Krishna's human-like pastimes, how can he be God and how can he be a human? And it's not that he's putting on a show and at the same time in the background he's thinking about all kinds of... He's not. He's just fully absorbed in that. And so at the same time he's also God and he's fully absorbed in that. And he's also in his human pastimes and he thinks that he's a cowherd boy and he's fully absorbed in that. Krishna's taking care of the cows. He is not thinking, he's not thinking about Sri Ram Swami giving class at Bhaktivedanta Manor. On the other hand, Krishna is also fully aware of Sri Ram Swami and not everyone else, but it's everyone else who's here and everything else, and he knows everything. So he knows and he doesn't know. How is it possible? 
That's by his inconceivable potency. And can we go further than that? Uh, we can have faith. And if we become empowered by that same transcendental potencies, then yes, we'll understand it. But otherwise, uh, there is limited value uh, in going, uh, going further. Best thing is that we'll say, how wonderful. So Vedanta Sutra explains uh, these things, and Srimad Bhagavatam elaborates on them. Uh, in, uh, in this pastime, uh, for instance, how uh, everything uh, is uh, opposite, opposing things. Uh, uh, in Brahma Samhita says these things, Andantarasta paramanu choyantarastam govindamadi purusham tamaham badami. It means that everything is in Govinda, and yet Govinda is in every atom, along with everything. That's a very inconceivable statement. In other words, saying that the, the whole, why don't we just take creations, so just to keep it uh, comprehensible, this universe is inside of Krishna. And every atom of this universe is inside of Krishna, but Krishna, along with every atom of the universe, is inside of every atom. So how can these two things, you have to just have to accept, it's possible. We can't conceive of such a thing. We could understand, all right, well, uh, everything's inside some person, or that some person is inside of everything, but how both of those things are happening at the same time for a three-dimensional logic and our thinking it's not possible. But it, either you reject it or then you just accept it this this. And it's wonderful because Krishna is so wonderful. Uh, and then this is elaborated later on. You see this when Mother Yashoda, and this is how, you know, Vedanta Sutra is described. Uh, so, Bhasyanam Brahma Sutranam. This is the Bhasya. This is the elaboration of Vedanta Sutra. And so, those pastimes, you shouldn't just take as stories. Uh, they have, aside from Krishna's Leela and having many different uh, uh, types of import for us, but uh, one of them is, is that they're actually elaborating uh, and they're uh, visualizing very complex philosophical statements that are obviously given in very sutra form uh, and helping <laughs> us think about them. So, Mayavadis or Brahmavadis or even students of Vedanta, they would just contemplate this. How is this? Uh, how are these uh, very short statements? How can they be understood? So Srimad Bhagavatam gives examples uh, and makes it understandable for very, for anyone. And so we should stop and think when we see these things, especially when they're, and Lord Brahma comes back to this pastime, although he doesn't refer to it directly, but it refers to the uh, same thing. That Mother Yashoda, you know, she heard the rumor from Balaram and friends that Krishna is eating dirt. So she grabs Krishna and uh, she says, okay, I heard you're eating dirt. And Krishna says, no, no, I'm not. So oh, yeah, the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this, open your mouth and let me see if there's any dirt in your mouth. So Krishna opens his mouth. And this is not the only time this happens. This happens twice. And the reason that not the same thing, but looking into Krishna's mouth and what happens. One is when she's uh, breastfeeding Krishna and the other one is over this. That must mean it's a very important point for us to grasp. Not that it's just nice pastime, that it's happening twice, but there must be something very important. What does she see? She sees universes and then this planet and then Brindavan and she sees, she's here, she's looking at Krishna's mouth, and she sees everything inside of him as well. In other words, she's outside of him, and she's inside of him. This world is outside of him, and yet it's also inside. At the same time, it's taking place. And this happens twice. 
That means it's an important message for us to get across. Oh, how is that possible? How can you be inside something, outside something at the same time? And, and at the same time, Krishna's, is Krishna aware of this? Is Krishna putting it on? Or actually, and uh, later on when this is analyzed, and these things are analyzed in great, great detail by Acharyas. They don't just say, what a nice pastime, and so on. They go into this in great, great depth because it's a very important uh, feature of Krishna's uh, teachings to us to fix our intelligence, to fix our minds. So, and Brahma later on says that when he actually, after the Brahma Mihomohana Lila, later on in the 14th chapter, then he points out this thing that yes, I'm inside of you, uh, it, that you're inside of everything and outside of everything, and while I'm standing here, I know that you're within everything, you're the original cause of everything. So he refers to the same principle of being within and without. So simultaneously he's big, at the same time he's very, very small. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important thing for us to uh, contemplate, and this is really one of the duties uh, of devotees because uh, it is the cornerstone of our philosophy, our, our, our philosophy in terms of uh, resolving and understanding many things that happen with, within this world, and ex especially when we start getting into the realm of this uh, uh, transcendence, is this Achinta Beda Beda uh, Tattva philosophy. Um, and Prabhupada would say yes. If uh, you can't, you can't understand Krishna unless you accept this, because we'll get stuck. We'll get stuck in all kinds of tarka. We'll get stuck in all kinds of mundane uh, arguments. Uh, and for this, yes, we need to uh, really expand uh, our own consciousness. And the more Krishna conscious we become, the more natural uh, this whole reasoning becomes, and, and of course uh, it's uh, like that. So then it uh, uh, continues on. Only a person who has firm faith in the wonderful pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can approach his lotus feet. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is taking the role of a devotee. So although he reveals divinity, and then of course once again devotees understood his transcendental nature, which he was also hiding, and his potencies were hiding. So how do we know what's in this book how do it, about God, if he's hiding it? So what is Prahlad Maharaj says, that he's a Chana avatar. He's, he's the hidden, he covers uh, himself, and if Krishna wants to hide, then you have a hard time finding him. And if Krishna wants to cover himself, then, uh, then you can't actually find him. So how is it possible that we know these things, that we know these truths about Lord Chaitanya, and that we actually understand the inner, inner reasoning of his appearance and so on? It's only because of his associates are revealing these things. He's not revealing it. So Krishna says, Aham Sarvasya Prabhava. He says, everything comes from me. Lord Chaitanya doesn't say everything comes from me. So, but his devotees uh, reveal all of these things. So everything that we know about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is coming from him. And although there were the occasional uh, displays of divinity, particularly when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in uh, Mayapur and he had this wonderful 24 hours long or 28 hour long uh, revelation from one devotee to another, but, but generally uh, it, it was not. And what to speak of these very deep uh, uh, truths, so his devotees. Uh, and therefore for us, uh, even more and Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes this statement in his Amnaya Sutra, or one of those uh, uh, books that uh, he writes in Sanskrit, 
that even beyond actually the authority of Shastra uh, is the uh, authority of Krishna's eternally liberated uh, uh, devotees. Uh, because they say more things and they elaborate on what's Shastra. They'll say things that are not uh, in scripture. So this, these uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's tattva and truth is hidden. Krishna's hidden. What to speak of Lord Chaitanya. So uh, these things uh, are for us uh, the uh, unspoken words uh, of the Vedas. And therefore something that's unspoken that gets spoken and one says has even greater authority. Okay, I've gone over my time. And how we did that was inconceivable. It was pretty inconceivable. I just kept talking <laughs> another seven minutes. And, uh, but yes, uh, very, very uh, extraordinary, contradictory characteristics. For instance, when you read this Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, uh, Dhirodhata, Dhirodhata, Dhir Lalita, and Dhir Shanta. These are four different types of behaviors that Krishna has. Once again, psychiatrists get into behavioral patterns that people have. So, on one side, Krishna is very, very humble. On the other side, Krishna can be very, very proud. And it's not that he has these occasional, these are like permanent characteristic traits. They're contradictory, there's four of them. Uh, but they're only resolvable by the fact that, yes, he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, and therefore you can resolve these things. Um, and then getting into Krishna's Leela, that you really have to be extremely broad-minded, and you have had, had to gone beyond this uh, in order to understand uh, Krishna's uh, exchange with his associates, especially when it gets to Vrindavan, and especially when it gets to Krishna's uh, association uh, with the gopis. Uh, this Atrinta Tattva helps to sort of expand our mind, you know, it's like a elastic, you keep pulling it enough and then it stretches out. So our brains need to expand uh, more and more uh, in order to uh, be able to enter into the teachings uh, of uh, Krishna's Leela and uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu pastimes, which is actually the way in which Vaishnavas are meant to enter into Krishna's pastimes. How did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appreciate those uh, and relish those? When we go through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then that becomes uh, the safest way to enter into Krishna's pastimes. Hare Krishna. Jai Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Nitai Go Premanandi So I'm at, I, I left off at 310. So there's a few more verses till the end of the book. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. And uh, there are very conceivable reasons why I have to stand up right now and uh, Leave the temp for room. <laughs> so we'll see you later. Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 <laughs>